If you're a fan of the JBF7 flight controller, then today is a very exciting day for you because I am about to tell you all about the new JBF7 V2. We've made a couple of significant upgrades and additions to the JBF7. If you love it, I think you're going to love this one even more. I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. I figure we'll just start the video with a little bit of an unboxing. Uh, and inside the box, we've got the vibration isolating gummies. We've got the flight controller itself. And we've got some pre-terminated wires. That's right, one of the improvements we've made has been plug headers. For those who want to be able to plug and unplug their accessories instead of soldering them, you're going to have some options there. Hopefully this will make it a little bit easier for some beginners. Of course, all the solder pads are still just as they were. And actually, as long as we're looking at these vibration isolating gummies, I want to show you a small improvement that we made in the board because a lot of people struggle to get them in. And there's tricks you can use to get the gummies in a little bit easier. But especially if maybe you don't have as much dexterity for whatever reason, it can be a real hassle. The JBF7 V2 has these little slits in the sides of the mounting holes, which makes it easy to just squeeze and slide a gummy right on in there without any hassle. And of course, they'll still hold just as securely as they did before. Just like on the previous version, we have gone out of our way to make it as easy to solder on as possible. All of the solder pads are big. They're as big as we can make them while still fitting them all on the board. That means that they're gonna be easier to solder to if you're a beginner, and it means that they're gonna be less likely to lift them if you're a little bit inexperienced with a soldering iron because larger pads have more mass and can take more heat before they lift off. Obviously, we can't promise that they'll never lift off, but we've done our best to make them as durable as possible. And the pad layout is designed for optimum flexibility. So we've got a bunch of UARTs, and each UART, you've got a couple of them up front, T1 and T2, R1 and R2. So UARTs 1 and 2, those are up on the front of the board. You can use them for your camera or your receiver, perhaps. Uh, and here on the back, we've got three, four, and five. So there's five full UARTs here. On the front of the board, there is a five volt pad, uh, which is marked RX5V, and that is specifically for the receiver. That one will power up from USB. Um, some people have questioned why we put that on the front of the board, since a lot of times the receiver goes in the back of the quad, and I do agree that that's a valid question. Um, just Basically, when the board was being laid out, that was where there was room to put stuff. So that's where we put it, but um, eh, it'll be all right. If you have one of the few remaining receivers that needs a 3.3 volt output, there is a 3.3 volt output here. A little side tip, that is really useful if you have a GPS, a GPS unit on your quad. Uh, assuming that it's powered from 3.3 volt. A lot of them can be powered from anywhere from like 3 volts up to 5 volts. Um, it's better to run them off of 3.3 volts because they'll usually get cleaner power. And also if they're powered from 3.3 volts, then they will power up from USB. Whereas all the other 5 volt outputs on the flight controller do not power up from USB. Um, and the advantage there is you can plug the USB plug in to, um, well, anything, a computer, a power bank. You power up the GPS, you let it get lock, and then you plug in the battery, which powers up the video transmitter and the receiver, and makes a whole bunch of electrical noise. That oftentimes makes it harder for your GPS to get lock. So I always recommend using that 3.3 volt for the GPS if, if it's available, even though most people today aren't using receivers that need a 3.3 volt output. You can see here we've got a 9 volt and a 5 volt regulator on board, and they are both big honking regulators. Uh, I'm not looking at the specs right here. I think they're rated for at least 2.5 amps, and the actual ability is higher than that, but we try to be conservative about the rating so you can really trust it and get it. Pretty much anything you want to run off of here, a, a powerful video transmitter, you could be able to run off it without having any trouble. I think the only place you could get yourself into trouble is if you try to run LEDs. If you have a, like three or four LEDs, it'll be okay. But if you've got like 25 LEDs, you're gonna need a dedicated regulator for that. All the typical stuff you run off a flight controller regulator though, you're gonna be good to go with these. Coming around to the backside, we do have an SDA and SCL pad. That is the I squared C interface that is used for compasses. If you have a GPS that has SDA and SCL wires, that means it's got a compass built in. And it turns out that Betaflight doesn't do a lot with it. But if you are doing GPS rescue, or if you just like having the compass heading 
in your OSD, then you might want to do that. If you decide to use the SDA and SCL pads, you should be aware that they are shared with UART 3. So you can use SDA, SCL, or UART 3, but not both. If you try to use both, the stuff they're connected to won't work right. Coming around the way here, we've got the hookups for the video transmitter. That could be either 5 volts, or we've got one here labeled VTX 9 volt. That VTX 9 volt pad is switchable. It can be switched on and off using the user one aux mode function, also known as the real pit function. That is not available for the 5 volt output, but m most people are probably using a 9 volt video transmitter I don't know. Uh, we couldn't really do both, so we picked the one we thought most people would be using. And that is true if you are using the, uh, if you're using like uh, DJI or Walksnail or HD0, you can also switch digital as well as analog video transmitters using this function. It's pretty nice because it lets you power up your quad, but your video transmitter stays powered down until you flip a switch on your controller, then your video transmitter powers up when you're ready for it to go keep you from blasting people out of the air if you're flying in a group, or just keep your video transmitter from overheating uh, if you're not flying immediately. Coming around to the side of the board here, there's a few more pads that are worth a look. Uh, first of all, we've got additional power outputs, a great big ground, 5 volt, 9 volt, and VBAT pad. And the idea there is that there's just a little bit of extra space if you've got any other accessories and it wasn't convenient or you ran out of 5 volt or 9 volt or VBAT pads anywhere else on the board. You can, of course, solder multiple wires to these pads. You can do that with any pad and it'll power them, but um, we made them extra big so it's a little easier if you end up wanting to solder two or three wires to the same pad. Uh, coming down to the second row or the outermost row, uh, this board has eight motor outputs. Um, and we can see here on the top of the board, here's M5, 6, 7, and 8. You can run an octocopter, a hexacopter. It does support D-shot and bi-directional D-shot for all of them. Um, the motors 5, 6, 7, and 8 are on top, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 are on the bottom. We'll look at that in just a second. 5, 6, 7, and 8 being on the top, though, are also useful because if you're running a quadcopter, you can remap them to some other function using Betaflight's resource remapping function. And we thought that would be super, you know, just some extra pads there that you can remap to kind of whatever you want within the capabilities of Betaflight, of course. Continuing on down, we've got the LED strip pad for programmable LEDs and buzzer minus and buzzer plus for your buzzer. Before we flip to the underside of the board, I do also want to show you this. There are diagnostic LEDs here. And I'm going to I'm going to admit I first saw this on a diatone flight controller and I thought that's so cool and I said, "Can we do that?" And I don't know if like I mean, some people are going to say, "Oh, you're ripping off diatone." It's a great idea. I don't think it's like a patentable patentable idea where, you know, but I do want to give credit where credit's due. I feel like it's the least you can do. Um, and these LEDs light up when we have battery voltage and they show us that the 5 volt, the 9 volt, and the 3.3 volt regulator are uh, working. And then there's the status LED, which just blinks. That's the normal beta flight status LED. It's nice because like, let's say your receiver doesn't power up. Is it your receiver? Is it your 5 volt regulator on your flight controller? Well, you just glance at this LED, and if the 5 volt pad uh, light is lit up, it tells you the 5 volt regulator is working. That's pretty slick. The flight controller does come with a plug for the USB port, and if we pull that out, we'll see one of the most anticipated changes in the JBF 7V2. It's a USB C plug! Yay! And in addition to USB C plugs, uh, number one, you can plug them in either way around, so you can't, there's no upside down flippy floppy thing, like with micro U. They are more durable overall, they just have more mating cycles, and I'm told by people who design PCBs that the way that they attach to the PCB is more secure than a micro. And so that problem that you sometimes run into, yes, even with my flight controller, where you plug the USB in and the USB plug rips off, hopefully that won't happen at all, or if it does happen, it'll happen less often with this flight controller than with the previous version. If we flip the flight controller over, we can see that I insisted that it still have an SD card reader for black box logging. And I know that the vast majority of people don't use this, but it's my flight controller and I want to be able to black box log all day long with it. And only SD cards let you do that. So it's got an SD card reader on there for black box logging. I don't care if you don't, if you don't use it, I'm going to use it. <laughs> Continuing along, we also have these pads here. These are for the ESC plug. 
uh, and they just duplicate the things in the 4-in-1 ESC plug, including battery, ground, motors 1, 2, 3, and 4, current sense input, and uh, telemetry input, ESC telemetry input. That's, you're probably not going to use these. They can be useful when troubleshooting. If you're wondering, like, if your VBAC connection is getting through or if, you know, if you've pinned out your, your wires correctly, you can use a continuity tester to test these pads rather than trying to, like, use the backside of the plug, which can be tricky. But, you, you know, if you ripped off the plug or something, you could solder these. Or if you just don't like plugs, you could solder these. So they're there for you. Now, we've also got a bunch of plugs here. And in order to understand what those plugs do, we're going to have to go to the user manual. And yeah, of course, there's a great de detailed user manual that I wrote, obviously. Here is the manual, and I've printed it for this video, but it's available as a PDF downloaded from the Race Day Quads product page. By the way, Race Day Quads is the manufacturing partner for this. They basically put up all the money to make the flight controllers. So thank you to Race Day Quads for working with me on this. I'm at a point right now in my career where I could probably make any product I want with pretty much anybody I want. But Race Day Quads did this with me way back when. Uh, that was much less of a sure thing, and I sure do appreciate it. Well, my very first flight controller was years and years ago, and they've stuck with me, and I've stuck with them since then. So thank you, Race Day Quads. If we just flip into the manual here, we can see, first of all, the, there's a super detailed wiring diagram that the way that I've printed it has not worked out well. I will I will fix that. We'll look at that in just a second. <laughs> and we've got a board layout quick reference and descriptions of what all the pads are. And here we come to the underside of the flight controller with a breakdown of all of the different plugs. Now, the purpose for each of these plugs, obviously you can use them for whatever you want. If you know what you're doing, you can say, okay, here's T2 and R2, and you can just use that UART for whatever you want. But they actually have a specific intent and the manual goes deep into that. So if we look here, at the very beginning, we've got a plug for 4-in-1 ESC. So here are all the plugs that come in the box. And of course, uh, each one has a specific purpose, trying to make your life a little bit easier as you wire up your quad. This plug goes to the 4-in-1 ESC. And uh, you're probably wondering, what ESC does this go with? It'll, it'll go with any iFlight ESC. iFlight is the manufacturer of this flight controller. So uh, currently, I think the iFlight Blitz is the ESC that's being sold, but if you have an older iFlight SuxX ESC, you should always double check the pin out before you make any assumptions, because I wouldn't want you to fry it because there's some oddball ESC that doesn't work. So double check the pin out, but it should match any iFlight ESC. And obviously, if you need to, you could repin or you could solder to the pads on the bottom if you wanted to make it work with any ESC that you happen to have. Here we've got a plug for the DJI Air Unit or the HD0 VTX, that is this one. By the way, I also want to point out that the 9 volt output here inside this plug is also switched. So if you are doing the real pit function to switch your VTX on and off, that will work if you're using this plug. You do not have to direct solder just to get that function. The next plug is for analog cameras. If you are using an analog camera, then good news, you'll be able to use this wire to probably plug in without any soldering whatsoever. We've got another plug for an analog video transmitter, and this one is going to output 9 volts. It's got the VTX video input, and it's got a full UART, and that UART is intended to be used for smart audio. You would only use the TX pad. Uh, you wouldn't use RX. Next, we've got the receiver plug, and this one only has a plug on the flight controller side. The, there are so many receivers out there, and most of them require you to direct solder. So you're going to solder the wires to your receiver on one side and plug in on the other side. And then finally, we've got a plug here for your LEDs, programmable LEDs, if you've got them, and the buzzer. And again, we just wanted you to have the option to plug everything in if you didn't want to solder to the flight controller. So here they are. Now, there's two more big additions that have been made to this flight controller that are going to really excite you. And the first one is that we have added a barometer to the board. And Betaflight isn't going to do much with that. But the hope was that eventually we could get this board with an INAV target made for it. And I was about to say, maybe someday INAV will support this board, but not today. But that is wrong because as of literally three days ago, as of the time I'm recording this, guess what? They have added the iFlight JBF7 Pro to the INAV target list for INAV 5.1. So you, I haven't even tested this yet. I literally just found out about this. You can flash INAV right now to this board. And if you do that, tell me how it works. 
Uh, maybe I'll do an INAF build with this board at some point in the future. The other change that is going to uh, raise him uh, maybe eyebrows is that the gyro on the board is the BMI 270 gyro. And also there's only a single gyro on the board. In the past the board had dual gyros, they were ICM series gyros, and there were some pros and cons of that. Uh, these days the BMI gyro is what most flight controllers are using mostly for financial reasons. Uh, as you know, there, it's 2022, hi, in the future. Have things gotten better? Are, are electronics cheap again? Because these days, the bare components that we use to make flight controllers, like the microprocessors and the gyro chips and so forth, they're all between two and five times more expensive than they were, and you just simply can't get a lot of them. So the BMI gyro is controversial because two reasons. Number one, it only runs at 3.2 kilohertz, not 8 kilohertz. And most people think that smaller numbers are worse, and therefore this one must be bad. That's just not true. In fact, Chris Rosser, Chris Rosser, did a test where he tested all these gyros against each other and found that the performance of the BMI gyro was actually on par with the MPU 6000, which is one of the best flight controller gyros we've ever had. And the ICM series gyros were slightly worse than that, just a little bit. So in that sense, the BMI is actually better than the ICM series gyros, even though it doesn't run at as fast a rate. The other thing uh, that the BMI gyro uh, is notable for is that it has different internal hardware low-pass filtering. And on older versions of Betaflight, that meant that the default filtering was not correct. That's no longer true. If you're running on Betaflight 4.3, and you should if you get this flight controller, it comes with Betaflight 4.3 on it, you should flash it first thing you get just to make sure you're on the latest. But uh, Betaflight 4.3 automatically accommodates the BMI gyro and has the correct filter settings and so forth, so there's really nothing to worry about. However, you are going to want to run at 3.2K, which is the fastest it can go. Don't let that confuse you when you don't see 4K or 8K, and you are going to want to run DSHOT 400. There's not really much point in running DSHOT 600 if you're only running the PID loop at 3.6K, so a little change you might want to make. There's one other thing that I have to acknowledge. And that is that the price of the board has gone way up. Um, and I've always prided my, like when people ask me, hey, do you want to do a product together? And, and they ask, do you want to do like an ultra premium product? And I always say, no, I want to do a product that is accessible to people at as many price ranges as possible. I would rather have a middle tier product with my name on it that everybody can buy than a high end product. And uh, the fact is that this board is as inexpensive as it could possibly be given how much the components that went into it cost to, to buy. Um, the profit margin on it is about the same as it was on the old JB F7 that was like $55. The cost to go in, the cost to buy the parts went up, the cost to go in up, and that's just what flight controllers of this quality level cost to make today. You can find cheaper ones out there. Maybe they're F4s, maybe they're F7s, maybe they have the same build quality. If that's where your if your budget is at the fifty dollar level, I don't begrudge you buying a fifty dollar flight controller. I think this is really good for the price and the features that it's got. And if you're interested in picking it up, there's a link down down in the video description below. Or just go to Race Day Quads, or hopefully it'll just be everywhere soon. But at the very least, it'll be at Race Day Quads because they're the ones who actually uh, were the lead in getting it manufactured. That's gonna do it for this video. I hope you love it. Hope you buy it. Happy flag.